Hi, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Not too loud? Perfect. So my name is Jeremy Fench. I'm a PhD student in Saclay, working with Pierre-Alain Duc. And my main collaborators are Fr uh, Florent Renaud, who talked earlier this, this afternoon on star clusters, and Frédéric Bourneau. So the context of my research is that we know that all local mer major mergers trigger starbursts. Is it also true at high redshift? So first of all, I'm going to describe what I call starburst. So to do that, I'm using the schmidt kanika relation. So we know that from galactic caves to high redshift disks, all um, galaxies follow a very tight relation. But you have Eulergs that are offset from this relation, that have a higher SFR from um, what we expect from their gas distribution. They are on the other sequence. And that's what I call starburst galaxies. So if we look closely at those starburst galaxies, we see that they all show signs of interactions. So there is kind of the equivalence between a local starburst and a major merger. And here I'm emphasizing the fact that it's local, because if we look at higher redshift, it's not the case. So here it's a very nice plot from Corentin Schreiber, early work in 2015. So here we see that both observations of galactic pairs and, and mergers from cosmological simulations show that at high redshift, you have a higher number of galaxies undergoing a major merger. But if we look at starburst, with whatever the definition of starburst, which is two times, three times, four times the star formation rate that you expect, the number is fairly constant with redshift. So there is something going wrong in, high, in the high redshift universe. Something is going to happen. So to uh, answer this question, I'm first going to review uh, how star formation proceeds in local mergers, and then I'm going to compare with simulations of high redshift galaxies. So first, let's have a look to a very nice starburst galaxy, and the antennae galaxies. So what we see is that we have star formation in the nuclei, but also star formation in the outer part. So here in the arc, and here in the overlap. So I'd like a lot of processes at the same time. We have shocks, we have gravitational processes. So I'm going to summarize those processes in only two. So here in the center, you have central gas inflows that are due to the interaction with uh, an interacting companion. So here you have a galaxy, here's a companion, and all the gas which is inside the galaxy below the co-rotation radius will tend to, to undergo a negative torque, which will bring the gas to the center where, where you will form a lot of stars. And second, here in the extended parts, you have what we call a compressive turbulence. You have gas fragmentation being caused by compressive turbulence. So what it is? So if we look at the very nice paper by Florent in 2014, you see that interaction drives two things. Compressive tides, that are a tidal field which is completely compressive in, both in all directions. And actually, in interacting galaxies, you have a lot of places where you have a compressive tidal field. So first in the nucleus, and then in the tidal tail here. So every, all red dots are places where you have a compressive tidal field. And then obviously, you also increase the turbulence. And the two, they're going to induce an increase of compressive turbulence, which is uh, um, part of the turbulence which is rotational free, that will, have, uh, that will, that will tend to compress the gas and form, and form new stars. All right, so that's a summary of what's happening in local, in local mergers. You have gas inflows that create a nuclear starburst, and you have compressive tides and turbulence, which will create an extended starburst. So now let's move at what's happening at high redshift. So what's the difference between local galaxies and high redshift? that here you have very irregular galaxies. They show a lot of clamps. They have a very high gas fraction, around 50%, and they show giant clamps. Uh, they show very, very nice clamps. So here, uh, what we're going to be interested in is this gas fraction. So we're going to make simulations of uh, galaxies by only changing the gas fraction. So we keep the same dark matter halo, the same total mass, the same distribution. We only change the gas to star ratio. So here you have a galaxy with only a fraction of gas of 10%, which is what we see in local galaxies. And here you have a galaxy with a gas fraction of 60%. So here you see that the behavior is very different. Here you have nice spiral arms, so that's the gas density, sorry, that's the gas density. So here you have nice spiral arms, whereas here you have huge clumps that survive for a long time and tend to migrate throughout the center. So now I'm going to do collisions of those galaxies. So here you have a lot of clumps. They see absolutely nothing from the collision, but here you have formation of small over densities, like a small fragments of gas that will form a lot of stars. So here you have the first Perissotosh passage, and then they're going to form only one, only one object. All right. So now let's have a look at the star formation rate during those collisions. So here, that's the star formation rate for uh, the gas poor collision. So you begin by like one to two solar masses per year, and after the collision, so here you have the distance, so that's the first Perissotosh passage, you have a factor of 20 increase in the star formation rate and more than 40 at the coalescence. 
If you look at the high redshift collision, it's a completely different picture. You start very high because you have two galaxies forming both 50 solar masses per year, so you begin with 100 solar masses per year. But at the first Paris center passage, you have almost nothing, like maybe a factor two increase in the star formation rate. And here, at the coalescence, it's a factor three to five maximum. So here, it's only one orbit, so I tried another one. I just returned the spins of the galaxies. So here, what you see from another one at low redshift, the same behavior. Here, high redshift. I mean, it looks like it's kind of the same for both. If we look at the behavior on the, on the Kennicott Schmidt diagram, that's what we see. So here, you have the disk and the starburst sequences from Genzel et al. 2010. Here you have the Gathridge galaxies, so the blue and red curve that I showed earlier. And here you have the gas pool. So you see that in the Gathridge case, you follow the isolated sequence, and then you go up, but only for a little. So that the first collision that I showed you is never considered as a starburst galaxy. All right. So now let's have a checking list of what I told you earlier. So we have two processes. You have gas inflows created by gravitational torques and gas fragmentation from compressive tides and turbulence. I'm just going to review those two processes and how they proceed in the two simulations. So I don't have much time, so I'm not going to enter into details for the gravitational talks, but what you have to remember is that in high redshift galaxies, you already have a lot of inflows towards the center because of the VDI. And the interaction is not going to increase that much, these inflows, inside the galaxy. So it's harder to increase inflows. But let's go now to the gas fragmentation and the two very interesting subjects that are compressive tides and turbulence. If we look at the, uh, the stuff, um, sorry, <coughs> uh, at the mass which is inside compressive tides, in the gas poor galaxy, we see that there are a lot of regions, like all the white dots here, and undergoing compressive tidal field. So here I plot it as a function of time. If here is the, is the first pericenter procedure and then the coalescence, the fraction of gas which is inside a compressive tidal field. So you start with around 5 to 10% of the gas. And then you go up by 20%, 25% of the gas is inside a compressive tidal field. But if we look at high redshift, all the tidal field is located around the clamps because they have a cold potential. So here you, you see that you have less, I mean, it's less extended. But it, at the beginning, you have 20% of the mass, which is in the compressive tidal field, because most of the mass is inside the clamps. But it doesn't change with, with the simulation. I mean, here in green, for example, for those that can see it, it's the same for an isolated case the first movie that I showed you, and we see basically no difference. So you have no increase of the gas fraction which is located in, in, in compressive tides. But also, if we want to look at the turbulence, so here I plotted a one-dimensional velocity dispersion for the gas pro case and the gas rich case, only with the first simulation. We see that the turbulence increases a lot from 10, 10 km per second to 40 to, to 30 to 40 km per second in the gas pro case. But it looks like it's saturated at high redshift because the Gas which galaxies are already very turbulent. They start with 35 km per second. And, and the interaction does, is not able to increase it more. So it's more like a factor 1.5, whereas it's more than a factor 4 for um, the gas pro case. All right, so now we're done with our checking list. We saw, I mean, I told you, and you have to believe me that, and I am, uh, I'm going to show you later, that the gravitational talks uh, show a winker increase. So we have, you have less gas, it means increase in gas inflows is weaker. And uh, for gas fragmentation, you do not trigger compressive tides, and you have a weaker increase of turbulence inside your simulation. So both mechanisms are less enhanced by the interaction when you have a high gas fraction. So star formation is less enhanced. Okay, so that's my summary, and I'm going to present these results in this paper, French et al. submitted to MNRS. It's not on archive yet, I'm waiting for the referee reports. Thank you very much. less time than yeah. uh, the 10 minutes. So we have uh, time for several questions, if people have any. Let me ask, uh, in uh, work that I did years ago with uh, my former student, T.J. Cox, we did similar sorts of mm. nearby galaxies with boosted uh, gas content. Uh, but it turns out that it depends a lot on what you assume for feedback, how much uh, boost you get. Uh, did you try different feedback prescriptions? Exactly. Uh, I t um, actually, I, I looked at what you get when you cut the feedback. So for feedback, we have that's the plot with uh, the simulation that we used. Uh, so it was uh, with Ramses. Uh, so the feedback we used H2 region ionization, radiative pressure, and supernovae. And uh, to check if it was an effect from feedback, we ran the gas-rich simulation without any feedback. 
So it's here. Mm -hmm. Here you have the stop formation that we saw from the beginning. So we've a weaker increase here at, at the pericenter, a burst at the coalescence. So we cut just before the first pericenter passage. So that's what we see. So that you, it's a bit higher because you have more compression, but there is no burst of star formation. Change. And it's the same at the coalescence. It's going to happen now. So you have no burst even without feedback. So it's more like an hydrodynamical process. And the basic reason uh, is it that these galaxies are already forming stars about as fast as they can. Oh, yes. So uh, the extra boost that you get from uh, the interaction actually doesn't give you that much addition. Yeah, the thing is, whereas you, at low redshift, yeah, at low redshift, you actually are starved of gas, and so increasing the compression has a big deal at low redshift, not so much effect at high redshift. I think that's a, a summary. Exactly. I think of what you were yeah. saying. The thing is, you will not move the density PDF during the interaction. I mean, I've got the plot with the different density PDF. It's uh, right uh, there. So here you have the density PDF for the low, low uh, gas fraction case. So you see that at the beginning, you're very close at the blue curve at the beginning. You're very close to the isolated case in purple. And then when you go up, for example, for uh, 400 mega years here, you have a huge increase of the gas in the high density tail of the PDF. But in the gas switch case, you have almost no increase. You have a small bump here at the coalescence, but right. that's it. So do you have more like a saturation of the density PDF? OK. I think it's very plausible. Uh, one question. Andre? Yeah, so, so an antenna is a rich environment where star clusters were studied to, like, to death, right? So you know uh, exactly about uh, cluster star formation at the resolution that you're working at. Uh, you could uh, try to put a model for star formation that's producing clusters and then test it directly against um, Observation. That's so exactly what I'm going to do in my okay, last Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let's uh, thank Jeremy and uh, <laughs> Shay. Are you set up? <laughs>